Good evening. The Chinese Defense Minister General Liang Guanglei is visiting India heading a 23-member delegation. And as we know now, the two sides have agreed to resume military exercises that first started in 2007 as part of efforts to boost defense ties and build confidence between the two neighbors. General Liang is the first Chinese Defense Minister to visit India in eight years. The last visit by an Indian Defense Minister to China was in 2006. The two sides have also agreed to hold high-level official exchanges, training of armed forces personnel at each other's facilities, and maritime security cooperation between the two navies. Indian Defense Minister A.K. Antony has also accepted the invitation to visit Beijing next year. General Liang's visit takes place at a time when the two Asian giants are competing vigorously to gain a foothold across the continent for resources. The two neighbors have had a love-hate relationship in the past and things came to a standstill after the denial of a visa to the then Northern Army commander by the Chinese in 2010. New Delhi promptly responded by freezing all bilateral ties, exchanges, bilateral defense exchanges with Beijing. Even though defense exchanges have restarted, issues like China declining to give visa to an IAF officer belonging to Arunachal Pradesh and the Chinese claim on the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh have proved to be major roadblocks in bilateral ties. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight on The Big Picture, we discuss the three things in particular. One, the Chinese defense minister's visit in itself. Two, the seesaw that is the Sino-Indian relationship. And most importantly, the future of the relationship between India and China. My guests tonight will be Gopala Swami Parthasati, former diplomat and distinguished author, Shrikant Kondapelli, professor of Chinese studies in JNU, as well as Bijoy Da, senior research fellow at IDSA. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. I'd like to start with Mr. Parthasati, if I could. So, the Chinese are saying this is military diplomacy this is a, this is the part of uh, this visit is part, a goodwill visit by the Ch chinese defense minister vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship with india the chinese defense minister has also said this is going to be the year of chinese and indian friendship and cooperation as a former diplomat sir how sincere is china really isn't it true that they mistrust us far more than we mistrust them well uh, one thing you must learn in dealing with china the speak, speak and, uh, spoken word at any given point is time is not the final word. I think that's the degree of reality. Also on military exchanges, yes, this year has seen vastly expanded Chinese military contacts, not just with India. As General uh, Liang is here, at the same time his uh, chief of general, uh, deputy chief of general staff is visiting uh, Vietnam, right. uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Myanmar and Malaysia, Malaysia and Malaysia. Mm. So I think um, this is part of that. But more importantly, I think China realizes that they have perhaps uh, got themselves into a fix on the South China Sea. Mm. They have maritime disputes with everybody. They find themselves pretty isolated, though they got um, the Cambodians to bail them out at the ASEAN uh, summit. Mm. So I think... Um, Talking to India at this point in time uh, makes sense. We need to be, uh, and also I think with regard to piracy, there has been a substantive measure of naval cooperation. Right. Um, along with Japan uh, as well. Along Neighbor with India. Japan, yes. yes. And uh, really we have a coordinative mechanism based in Bahrain mm. to deal with piracy in the Indian Ocean. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, there is a cooperative element. Uh, there is a competitive element. Mm. Uh, there is also an element of uh, the need for caution given Chinese territorial claims. Right. So it's it's a mix. Right. Going to Srikant Kondapalli now, sir. Uh, welcome to the show, first of all. Staying on the trust deficit now, do you think that this particular visit by the Chinese Defense Minister right now uh, will assuage some of India's concerns, like the most recent uh, alleged build-up in, in uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir as well? The Chinese Defense Minister says uh, they haven't sent a single soldier uh, across to POK. Your take on that? Well, his statements uh, needs to be taken with a pinch of salt because right. uh, during the uh, earthquake and the uh, uh, flood situation in POK and northern areas, the Chinese Air Force did send helicopters to that region. Uh, and uh, also we need to factor in that the construction corps and the engineering corps uh, who have now been, uh, which have now been uh, merged with the uh, civilian administration uh, they were part of the PLA before. Hmm. Uh, the Chinese have invested in the uh, dual-use projects, uh, civil military projects in uh, POK and northern areas. For example, the Karakoram Highway is being expanded by 30 meters wide, yeah. uh, which can be used for military 
as well as for civilian purposes. Uh, so China is showcasing all those there uh, in terms of the dual use uh, nature. Mm. Uh, these can be used for the civilian purposes or for the military purposes. Right, so, right. Taking off from that, I'd like to go to Bijoy Das, who's also joined us on the program. Bijoy, you heard what Srikant and Mr. Parthasati just said. My question to you is, how can one expect these talks to be fruitful when the fact remains that 15, uh, 15 rounds of talks on the border disputes have made little headway and given China's aggressive stance uh, on most issues, be it the South China Sea or even the fact that they call uh, Arunachal Pradesh South Tibet, uh, even as recently as last week in, in the official maps, how can one expect these talks to even uh, be a little fruitful? Um, well, I'll agree totally with uh, Mr. Parthasarathy and Professor Srikant. The fact is, military diplomacy is important. And given the recent frozen nature between both the countries, it was important for China, with the entry of US and the recent bonhomie between US and India, it was necessary for China to make this overture. And that is the reason why they made this visit. It was on China's request, as is widely reported. But the question to ask from the Indian angle is, whether these talks, diplomacy apart, whether these talks are translated into substantive, positive action through concrete political and military cooperation or not. That is the question. Right, right, right. Uh, going back to Mr. Pasati, uh so the big issues, the non-negotiables on both sides, if you will, like issues like Arunachal, issues like the visa issues, they've carefully been avoided this time around. There's no language on, on those issues as well. Um, vague statements like holding high-level exchanges in the future, they've been doing the rounds as well. Uh, do you see this as a mutually agreed stance by both countries saying that, look, let's just start somewhere, let's just resume our defense exercises, and once we build a semblance of trust, perhaps then we can tackle those prickly issues? Look, we should re remember one thing, Chinese thought processes, and he's a much better uh, person to speak on that, are quite different from what we perceive them to be. The Chinese think long term. The Chinese, as I said, the spoken word today is not necessarily the reality. In 2005, Wen Jiaobao comes here and says, in settling the border, we will take into account settled populations. Mm -hmm. Arunachal Pradesh is a settled population, yet they are claiming it. Yeah. So I think they are quite capable of changing stance. You must bear that in mind. Right. There are two things in dealing with China. Historically, the Chinese respect power. They define their strength in terms of comprehensive national power. Mm. Now, as long as they perceive India to be lacking in some ways, they will exploit it to the hilt. Second, we should be very clear that they are going to balance us by continuing to provide Pakistan with weapons, with logistics, and even with the upgrading of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal, Pakistan's new generation of nuclear weapons with plutonium warheads mm. are going to emerge from uh, uh, Fateh Jang and Kushab, Chinese supplied. Right, right. Uh, taking off from there, I go to Bijay, Bijay Das. Uh, Mr. Pasarathi mentioned uh, their role in, in arming Pakistan as well. My question to you is, uh, Bijay, over the past decade, what, according to you, has exactly been China's role overtly and covertly in the defense and security environment in the Indian subcontinent as a whole? Your thoughts? You see, to start with uh, Pakistan, it's hardly any secret now. They have uh, given, as Mr. Parth Sarathi mentioned, uh, there was nuclear, there was missile technology transferred, now, there was main battle tanks, there's uh, cooperation on manufacture of uh, fighter aircrafts, JF-17 in particular. They are contemplating on J-10 and uh, then there has uh, been um, there's been uh, cooperation in the Navy, F-22 frigates, uh, Gwadar ports, you name it and have it. And small arms are routinely shipped to Pakistan. Besides that, they have generous uh, outlays of uh, cash. Uh, they, they give cash to the uh, Pakistan army. Now, to come to uh, Bangladesh. There was a time when uh, Bangladesh was given small arms uh, by Chinese. Uh, they also had some uh, um, 
assistance from China in Navy. I think it was again frigates. Uh, but beyond that, nothing much materialized. That has much to do with India's relations with Bangladesh. Now, uh, Myanmar, they had uh, small arms again. Uh, in Nepal, uh, they had small arms uh, from China. And the recent hotspot is uh, Sri Lanka. Right, Bijoy. Kambantota. We get your point, but the, what I was trying to say is that even General Liang, the Defense Minister of China, and the in defense establishment in general uh, have been reassuring New Delhi, they've been reassuring India uh, that uh, China's rapid military buildup and its growing investments in Myanmar and countries like Sri Lanka and Pakistan and Maldives, they're saying that there's nothing to worry about. But there is a school of thought in India which says the deepening involvement in all four countries has, has is is almost akin to uh, China encircling India. Isn't that a huge concern for us right now? It is. There's no doubt about it. It brings back to the square one question which uh, uh, Mr. Parsarathy mentioned is that you have to take it with a pinch of salt, number one. Number two is arms market for all these countries. It's a huge market for China and China has a definite edge in defense industry. So it will sell its products like any, any other products. And number three is another question to ask is, if China is so interested with our South Asian neighbors, why aren't they interested with India? Right, right. Uh, let me go quickly across uh, to Srikant Kondapalli, sir. How much of this uh, flurry of activity, if you can call it that, what, what Beijing calls military diplomacy, is happening because China wants support from its neighbors, especially slightly or relatively influential neighbors like India, uh, to act as a buffer when push comes to shove with the U.S.? Uh, with the United States, because of the improvement in uh, U.S.-India relations, uh, especially as we have seen in the last one year, we have had uh, 50 structured dialogues uh, uh, at various levels between U.S. and India. There is also the U.S. statement on uh, Indo-Pacific uh, 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 phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, the statement that was issued today uh, suggests to both the countries uh, looking for stability in the Asia-Pacific the word Asia-Pacific in the India-China parlance uh, for the first time comes up in this defense minister's meeting. Mm. Uh, previously, in uh, 2006, President Hu Jintao's visit to India, the word Asia was brought in for the first time. Uh, paragraph 43 of that joint declaration in two, 2006 had mentioned it, uh, indicating that step-by-step uh, step there has been a, an acknowledgement of the Indian role in Asia, uh, beyond the South Asia region, uh, to that of now Asia Pacific. I think part of this is driven by the US-India equation. Mm -hmm. uh, when the uh, US wants uh, India to play a bigger role in the Pacific, in the South China Sea, uh, in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. Right, right. Uh, we'll take a small break here, gentlemen. We'll come back and we'll discuss uh, the road ahead for India, Indo-Chinese relationships. Lots more to come on the big picture. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the big picture. We're discussing the defense minister of China. He is visiting India right now. He's been here since Sunday and he met A.K. Antony, the defense minister of India. He also called upon the prime minister of the country. And now, as we know, uh, India and China are going to resume their military, uh, bilateral military exercises that had stopped in 2010. Uh, when will they start exactly? We don't know yet, but there is a roadmap for that. And we'll talk about that a little further in the program. Uh, let me go across to uh, Mr. G. Parthasati, who's joined us, sir. Beijing is coming under increasing U.S. Uh, pressure to agree to a regional code of conduct uh, to reduce the risk of a conflict in the South China Sea. Now, China's claim over the South China Sea has also been very controversial. They've had uh, run-ins with Vietnam over it as well. Uh, do you see India playing a constructive role, role in perhaps dissuading China to follow an overtly aggressive stance uh, when it comes to territorial disputes with other nations in the region, like the South China Sea dispute, for example? And also, do you think that if Beijing continues on this uh, unilateralism uh, when it comes to territorial disputes, there could be a situation perhaps that arises where security in the region could be, uh, 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 there could be a security situation in the, in the region? Look, China's claims are not just on the South China Sea. 
they have claims against Japan in the East China Sea and they have claims with regard to South Korea in the Yellow Sea. So I think China's maritime territorial claims are insatiable. The important point is China does not really accept the norms laid down in the UN Convention on the Law of Seas to settle these issues. Mm -hmm. There are very clear ways of dealing with maritime boundaries. After all, we have settled our boundaries with Thailand, with uh, uh, Myanmar, with Indonesia, mm -hmm. even with Sri Lanka, on the basis of the median line principle, which is specified in international uh, conventions. So I think China is going to get itself increasingly isolated. How far it will go, I think, much in my view, depends on the internal situation in China. Mm. If they have problems, there will be a tendency for the army, the PLA, to become more assertive, a more nationalistic, bordering on jingoism. Chinese jingoism is a factor we have to take into account. We have had our ships uh, traversing the South China Seas to be warned that we are on Chinese waters when mm. they're, they're really international waters. So I think uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. I don't think India by itself is going to affect China's views on the South China Sea. It is India working in concert with the countries of uh, East and Southeast Asia, mm. with the United States, and indeed in what is called as the East Asia Summit, where the Americans are present, the Russians are present, uh, Australians, New Australia. Zealand are present. So I think in that larger forum, when China finds itself pushed, it uh, is more amenable. But I, as I said, much is going to depend on the internal equations. They have stretched their claims very far now. How they are going to rationalize that remains to be seen. But yes, we have to work with other countries. And as an interesting point, as Professor Kodanpalli was saying, they have now agreed to an Indian role in, in the Asia-Pacific. Mm. Do you know a couple of years ago, China did its best to be prevent our becoming a dialogue partner of ASEAN? Right. It tried its best to prevent us from joining the East Asia Summit. Mm. So I think slowly reality is dawning on them. Mm. And as both the other interlocutors here have said, mm. the um, fact of the matter is that as the Indo-American relationship goes close, more important, as the Indo-Japanese relationship goes close, and the Indo-Vietnamese relationship goes close, mm. China will have to take notice. Right, right. Do you agree with that? First of all, I mean, first point, uh, as, as in India and US become increasingly clo closer because of economic ties, and otherwise uh, China is starting to get a little insecure, also with the relationship uh, India and Japan have right now, and they'll have to at least, like he said, they've, they've started realizing that they'll have to make amends at some point with India. Well, from the point of view of uh, U.S.-India relations, U.S.-India-Japan trilateral, I think the Chinese should not have uh, any complaints because during the Cold War, U.S.-China were pretty close uh, and directed against New Delhi, that kind of uh, an alliance. Mm -hmm. So uh, they did play that kind of role before, and hence I think uh, uh, we should not have had uh, such complaints from the Chinese that uh, Indians and uh, Americans and the Japanese and the Vietnamese are coming together. Right. Uh, on the second point, I think in terms of the resolution of the uh, South China Sea, uh, it's interesting to note that Mr. Anthony's uh, interaction with uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Panetta, mm -hmm. uh, where he mentioned uh, a few months ago, this is fairly fairly recently, uh, yeah. June, when uh, came, yeah. in June, uh, where he mentioned about the. Uh, uh, possible resolution of the uh, dispute through a bilateral mechanism mm. rather than through a, a multilateral uh, mechanism. Mm. So I think uh, India had expressed its opinion mm. on the South China Sea dispute resolution. Right. Uh, Bijoy Das, uh, uh, you're still with us. Your thoughts on what, what my two guests in the studio just said uh, about uh, how China is becoming increasingly insecure uh, because India is closer to Japan, because India is closer to the US. And how does it uh, apply to, uh, to vice versa? When, uh, what would the US be thinking when the defense minister of China is meeting the defense minister of India? Would they also be a little shifty, a little insecure? Number one, on the question of uh, China, there is no doubt. I totally agree with my previous two senior interlocutors. Number two, as for U.S. is concerned, I think they're pretty sure that they have nothing to worry about at this point of time. What rolls ahead in three, four years ahead is a thing unseen. But at this point of time, there's no reason because there's 
no solid propag no solid agenda agreed to by china and india to dispel the mutual uh, political trust uh, mistrust uh, between the two countries and uh, the two main factors which are driving china's interest towards india in my what i have found in my recent interactions with them is number one is the south asian market and number two is the power supremacy where the us angle comes in mm. so india right now although there's a school of thought which says that india is an enviable position with two great powers trying to woo it actually we are in a very difficult diplomatic position to make a long term strategic choice and vision Right, uh, Bijoy. One one follow up question before we go into another break. You uh, were in China recently. I remember when you came back. Uh, uh, what is the feeling in China? What is the feeling in Beijing right now, vis a vis uh, uh, India's role uh, in the subcontinent right now? India's role on the diplomatic table around the around the world. Uh, do they at least, like Mr. Parthasathi said, have they realized that uh, it's not 1970 anymore, and we have progressed way far ahead, and we're actually a potent force uh, on the world table right now? is there a realization in in beijing or are they still treating us with kid gloves see there is a realization but it has not come home yet they are trying their best to hold on to that old uh, school of thought and which if they don't shed i am afraid they may find themselves on the wrong side of history right Right, right, Mr. Bijay Das. We'll take another break right now. We'll come back uh, in the last segment. We'll discuss the road ahead uh, and how difficult it's going to be for India to tackle and handle uh, our neighbor on the northeastern side. Stay tuned to the big picture. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the big picture. We're still discussing India and China and the relations between the two countries. Uh, Mr. Kondapalli, Professor Kondapalli, uh, despite tensions between India and China, trade between India and China has soared from five billion in 2002 to nearly 75 billion last year. Even though it's heavily skewed in in China's favor, surely both countries realize that any conflict would disrupt their booming trade, and neither would want that. You think that's that's agreed on both sides that they do not want to disturb uh, a trade and and the growing uh, economic ties that they have. Uh, do you think so? Uh, yes, I think so because uh, recently, about a week ago, uh, Chen Deming, uh, the uh, Commerce Minister, had visited uh, India, uh, and we have had uh, discussions in terms of uh, enhancing uh, uh, trade, uh, market economy status in China. The the uh, imbalance in trade position that we have had uh, uh, so far uh, all these issues are being discussed uh, yet at the same time two three other things are happening one uh, there is uh, a kind of stalemate on the border which means that border trade is not taking off mm. uh, because of the unresolved uh, territorial dispute uh, secondly because of the imbalance in trade uh, there has been uh, a pressure on china to open up its market for indian pharmaceutical as well as the software industries uh, exports mm -hmm. uh, number 3 in terms of the uh, the uh, wto procedures and so on we have uh, uh, been slapping uh, several anti dumping duties on mm -hmm. the uh, chinese products in the uh, indian market so these three things are happening at the same time uh, india has also not uh, opened up the uh, indian market uh, or the proposal of, uh, by china that there should be a free trade uh, zone Uh, between China and India. Right, right. This has also been blocked by the uh, Indian side uh, because we have concerns on the uh, on the uh, kind of influx of goods that China may uh, do in the Indian market. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, nearly 35 percent of the uh, Chinese um, uh, power generation uh, equipment uh, now in the Indian uh, um, market. Uh, there is also the telecom sector uh, which is heavily uh, now coming from the chinese zts yeah. uh, you have uh, huawei right. uh, and other companies so uh, on the one hand uh, uh, prime minister manmohan singh statement that uh, we have uh, a requirement of nearly 1 trillion dollars in the infrastructure projects mm -hmm. uh, which is reflected in this manufacturing sector and the telecom uh, 
right. uh, sector uh, component by the Chinese. Mm. Uh, second is uh, the uh, Mr. Anand Sharma's statement that we have to expand our manufacturing sector from 14% to 29%. Mm. Uh, since China has some strong uh, position in the uh, low so to medium manufacturing So you're saying basically realization sector. on both sides and, and perhaps booming trade between the two countries will of, of course act like a safety valve uh, to, to prevent uh, any further uh, escalation of violence. Let me go to quick, very quickly across to Bajaj Das. Sir, we have very little time. Very briefly, if you could, apart from resuming uh, joint military exercises like we're going to do India and China, what other confidence building measures, uh, in your opinion, can the two countries uh, work on to create an environment of trust and cooperation in the subcontinent? Briefly, sir, if you could. Number one is an annual defense dialogue between the two defense ministers. And number two is that the mutual concerns, defense and security concerns of both these uh, countries have to be uh, recognized on a basis of equity. These are two basic confidence building measures which can be acted on. Right. Right. Uh, last word on the show, I want to give to Mr. G. Parthasarthi. Sir, very briefly, if you could, is growing trade, uh, like Mr. Kondapelli mentioned, growing to be enough of a safety wall to release all the tension? In other words, what I'm asking you is, is our growing commerce with each other enough to sufficiently prevent uh, territorial and border tensions uh, from escalating into full-blown violence? The answer is no. Hmm. Uh, if there is an asymmetry, as there is, along the border where our, com our communications are deplorable mm. and even in terms of troop strengths and uh, infrastructure, the Chinese are ahead, uh, don't take anything for granted. Right. So I think that needs to be addressed. Communications and defense build up on the border. I have my concerns on that score. Secondly, uh, Professor Kodan Pale referred to it. You know, the most serious threat is non-conventional. Our energy security and our cyber security depending so heavily on China for telecom equipment and power equipment mm. can result in a grid failure again, Right, right. can result in a cyber attack right. on any section of our economy. Right, right. Let's get our act together and then we should be... Right, right. Uh, I think that was the prepared. key takeaway. I must have to stop you there. I must thank all my guests. The key takeaway, of course, like Mr. Parasati said, take everything the Chinese say with a pinch of salt. We'll have to wait and watch how these military exercises uh, try and build the confidence that they're supposed to do. That's all the time we have on The Big Picture tonight. I uh, must thank all my guests for joining me. Uh, Bijoy Das, I, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Professor Srikant Gondapendli and Mr. G. Parasati for joining me on the show. Atar Khan saying goodbye, good night, And thank you for watching The Big Picture.